Good morning. On behalf of VIT Bhopal University, I welcome you all to the first lecture of planned lecture series, which is to be delivered by Professor Deepankar Banerjee, Director Aries Nanital, myself, Dr. Sharachan Tripathi, and I have Dr. Pradeep Kumar Kashyap with me. We are your hosts for today's interaction with our esteemed guest. Professor Deepankar has joined us, and now we are quite privileged to have him at this platform of VIT Bhopal University. Welcome you, sir. We will have the first lecture first, and then we'll open the session for Q&A. You can post your questions in the chat box, which can be asked after the talk, and we will be taking a few questions from the discussion directly from the audience. Now, I request my fellow colleague, Dr. Pradeep Kumar Kashyap, to introduce our today's speaker to the audience. It's over to you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Professor Dipankar Banerjee is currently the director of Aryabhat Research Institute of Observational Sciences, Aries Nenital. He is an astrophysicist with a bachelor's degree in physics, St. Javier Polis, and master's degree in theoretical physics from the University of Kolkata. He has obtained his PhD from Indian Institute of Astrophysics and completed two postdoctoral tenure in the Deputy Institution in Europe. Dr. Banerjee's area of interest is the sun and the solar atmosphere. His work involves theoretical and numerical modeling using data from ground and space-based instruments. His work has enriched our understanding of the sun and its impact on space weather. He is the co-chair of the science working group of Aditya Mission. Aditya is the first dedicated Indian mission to study the sun, expected to be launched by ISRO around 2021. He is uh, also the project uh, coordinator of the National Large Solar Telescope and LST. And LST is a proposed two-meter ground-based telescope planned to be installed at the Himalayan site. He is also involved with NASA's punch mission. Dr. Banerjee has more than 120 peer-reviewed publications with around 3,000 citations in international journals. He is currently supervising six PhD students, while 11 of his students have completed their PhDs. Apart from his scientific career, Dr. Banerjee has interest in various other activities. He is trained in Hindustani vocal and is a part of Bengali theater Samarni and regularly performs in plays participating in national and international theater festivals. Dr. Banerjee's love for science and gist for life are infectious. We welcome you again, Professor Banerjee. It's over to you, sir. Thank you, Pradeep. Uh, just let me try to share my screen first. And uh, let me get it confirmed from you. Yeah, you're able to see my full screen? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, okay. Uh, good morning. It's a pleasure for me to be there on this uh, platform, although virtually. <laughs> we are getting a little tired about uh, these virtual platforms and really sincerely hoping that uh, time has come now for in-person interactions. So hopefully next time when I'm in Bhopal, I'll be able to see you face to face. So what I uh, felt that you know, I will give you a glimpse about uh, the kind of um, work uh, which I do or my students or colleagues here uh, do on the subject of uh, our nearest star, the sun. And why do we study sun? That will be the main uh, topic of discussion today. But uh, before I go, probably I will give you a glimpse of, uh, uh, you know, of the observatory where I am now and the campus where I'm sitting right away. Uh, I'm not in my office though, I'm at, at home in the, in the same campus, but uh, you see this picture, uh, this is uh, my office, main building. Then, uh, you know, we have a few old uh, telescopes here and uh, other, you know, observational facilities in terms of astronomy, astrophysics research, and also atmospheric sciences. Uh, Aries uh, have, uh, you know, a lot of low Earth atmosphere, stratosphere, troposphere uh, research facilities uh, as well. So those who are interested in nighttime ast astronomy, daytime astronomy, namely the sun, and uh, atmospheric sciences, uh, Aries is, uh, is a good uh, destination uh, for them. Um, so I will give you a quick tour of uh, our campuses because we have two campus now. So Aries's uh, main mandate is to promote, guide, and carry out frontline basic research 
in the area of astronomy, astrophysics, and atmospheric sciences, as I mentioned. It was a state observatory uh, more than uh, uh, you know, half a century before, and then it was taken over by the Department of Science and Technology in 2004, after the formation of uh, state of Uttarakhand. So we build and operate state-of-the-art facilities uh, to study Earth's atmosphere, planet stars, galaxies, and other celestial objects and phenomena. Made several important contributions to the field, including the discovery of rings of Uranus, Neptune. These are historical discoveries listed. And uh, we operate these two major facility. Um, the Devasal Africa Telescope currently is the largest telescope in Asia and um, operational from this site called Devasal, which is 2.5 kilometer altitude, about uh, two hours drive from this campus. And we have a STRR facility in this campus, which is at two kilometer altitude. Again, a global view of these uh, two campuses. The top panel shows the Manora Peak Danital campus. Uh, here I am in this uh, campus now. And Devasal is about uh, 50 kilometers east of Nanital city. Uh, and there are a few telescopes here. I will talk about them as well. More closer view of this. This is the one meter Sampurnana telescope, which will be completing 50 years of its operation this year. We'll be having probably a national level meeting to celebrate that event. And then we have a solar telescope, a modest 15 centimeter telescope, which is operational almost uh, uh, 20 years now. Uh, primarily we look at solar flares uh, and, and, and so on. I will show some examples of solar flares today. And we also have a 50 centimeter Smith telescope. This is, uh, you know, now we are considering to be used for other uh, purposes, uh, primarily for education, outreach, uh, and, and so on as well. A close up of this one meter telescope, uh, one of the oldest telescopes in the country. Exactly the same telescope is there at Kavalur in, in, in the south, uh, minted by Indian Institute of Astrophysics. So uh, it's amazing that these German telescopes are so steady and so uh, you know rugged that still do, uh, the function that it's full potential. And our PhD students uh, every day you know walk up to the uh, hill and uh, start observing from there uh, who lives in the campus. This is the close-up of the solar telescope, a, a 15 centimeter H alpha telescope. As you see the camera behind it and underneath this building, this is the observing floor. And uh, one can uh, observe uh, the dynamical changes in the solar atmosphere, namely the chromosphere through this H alpha filter at a pretty high cadence. Means, you know, very rapidly you can take uh, uh, images. A close up of the uh, Davis cell campus. Before we had this uh, uh, 3.6 meters Davisal optical telescope, uh, we installed a 1.3 meter telescope. This was almost as, you know, uh, of the shelf uh, telescope since operation from 2010. This was also used to, you know, stabilize this uh, operation and this uh, remote site, uh, setting up all the, you know, uh, um, network facilities, uh, the uh, power and connectivities, GPS and all this. This is again a fully functional day-to-day uh, -day operational telescope. Lots of PhDs come from this telescope because this is exclusively used by ARIES uh, students and faculties. And uh, the, of course, the 3.6 meter telescope is the national facility. It's uh, heavily uh, oversubscribed. People have to apply for observing time and through the competition, and time is allocated a few hours to a one night max uh, observation from this uh, uh, you know, largest telescope in the country. We are also installing a new uh, four meter liquid mirror telescope uh, whose first light was expected in 2020, but because of the pandemic, uh, we are just uh, you know, uh, halted. Uh, and uh, our collaborators from Canada and Belgium are expected to come actually uh, probably uh, end of March or early April, and we should be having its first light here. It's a unique facility. Currently nowhere in the world such a facility exists because of operational challenges. It's uh, quite, uh, uh, quite innovative. 
normally what you know is a telescope have a, a, a mirror uh, for as a reflecting surface uh, to collect the light but the mirror of such large size for meter uh, demands uh, you know a lot of cost uh, stability uh, the the polishing uh, uh, and that so on suppose you take mercury which you know is a, is a liquid and pour that mercury in a big bowl and you start rotating that bowl so what will happen is this liquid will spill and create a you know uh, a curved surface i mean depending on the shape of the bowl it will be spread all over and it will create a reflecting surface with the shape of that particular bowl and if you make that ball in the shape of a you know curved mirror then you get quite easily uh, with the help of mercury a reflecting surface a very high uh, you know reflectivity because mercury is uh, very good uh, it's clean um, um, uh, as well it's much easier to keep it clean and so reflectivity is very high so on a much lesser cost you get a mirror but of course there are other challenges that uh, since this uh, particular ball you have kept it uh, in one direction towards the zenith you can't actually move the ball left and right because then the mercury will spill in one side so uh, this is a non steerable telescope it is always looking at the zenith but with a very high uh, you know field of view and any object coming within that field of view you can observe much more easily so it's a sort of dedicated robotic telescope uh, and of course it collects lots of data it will have uh, you know possibilities of uh, automated uh, image processing uh, you know you name it today's uh, world you know you have aiml uh, kind of applications uh, huge huge potential of uh, uh, you know using this kind of data for such applications close up of the 1.3 meter telescope uh, this is uh, made by the DFM US company, and you see the background uh, Himalayas. It's a pleasure to be there in that uh, that location. Uh, people used to go to mountain for uh, for you know uh, for samadhi. Uh, you can uh, go there and do your work and uh, just you know enjoy the Himalayas. You name any uh, mountain peak, Trishul, uh, Nanda Devi, Nanda Court. You can identify them from this site so it's, it's really really a pleasure to be in at that location this is the close-up of the 3.6 meter uh, davis cell optical telescope um, which was inaugurated by none other than uh, mr narendra modi our prime minister and uh, this is uh, really the state of our uh, you know technologically challenging you know uh, achievement i would say a, a telescope in this country this is a close up of this 4 meter uh, telescope which i was telling you which are we're all ready um, uh, for operations and hopefully we'll start operation very soon so that's a quick tour of uh, nainital and devastal campus now uh, today's uh, subject uh, our dear star the sun what I'm going to also highlight today is the concept of multi-wavelength. You know, uh, historically people were looking at the astronomical objects uh, from the ground through ground-based uh, telescopes. Those telescopes can only look at the optical wavelengths. So if I look at the sun through a optical wavelength, this is the electromagnetic spectrum at the top. And if I restrict my observation to the through an optical telescope and look at the sun and you also uh, normally uh, with your own eye which is sensitive to only optical wavelengths uh, will uh, you know see the sun like this there is a small little spot here these are called uh, sunspots these are concentrated magnetic field regions on the sun but you don't see much more from an optical image of the sun but if I now take image of the sun in other wavelengths, longer wavelengths, for example, an infrared uh, telescope, these infrared wavelengths are now possible to be observed from high altitude mountains also. Of course, you could go to space and look at the infrared wavelengths as well. Other shorter wavelength side, if I now move, if I 
go uh, to extreme ultraviolet, you see how much complexity you see uh, from the sun. And if I even go shorter wavelength like X-rays, I see much more uh, details as well. These shorter wavelengths are actually characterizing uh, the plasma, which is at a very high temperature. Most of the astrophysical objects are actually having multi-thermal you know, atmosphere uh, and surrounding. So when you have a temperature of millions of Kelvin, then it emits into shorter and shorter wavelengths, uh, primarily the X-rays and UV and all that. So that's the reason these days you see uh, major astrophysical advancement in the research and observational area because of the advent of the space era. So once we started going to space, we have started seeing this, you know, shorter wavelength uh, emission from the different astrophysical sources, and sun is no different. Fortunately, Earth has its own magnetic field. So that actually cuts these shorter wavelengths to reach us and it protects us. So that is one way uh, advantages for Earth's, uh, I mean, human existence, but it's a disadvantage for uh, observers like us that from ground, you can't see the X-rays or UVs and so on. So if you really want to observe the UV emission or the X-ray emission, you do have to go to space. So. Here you see this indication of extra telescope and, and the UV telescope and so on. That is now allowing us to see the atmosphere of the sun. So these image, uh, which was taken in the optical wavelength, represents uh, about 6,000 Kelvin temperature plasma, which is the surface temperature of the sun. Once we go away from the surface, means in the atmosphere, higher and higher up, up to say 1500 and 2000 kilometers, the temperature rises up to uh, tens of thousands of Kelvin. And these heights are called chromosphere. And then beyond that, beyond say 2000 kilometers or so, the atmosphere is called corona. And what you are actually seeing here is the low coronal emission uh, in the extreme ultraviolet. And this is a high corona emission from X rays. So these are called coronal images and uh, not the virus corona, but the about the solar corona. Um, I will talk about it, why uh, this uh, source of this uh, coronavirus has come from, actually it has come from uh, solar coronal images taken during the eclipses. And I will, I will show some examples of that. But now I want to highlight the importance of the multi-wavelength. And this is the key for modern day astronomy and solar physics in general as well. Now I will talk about the variability of the sun at different time scales. The sun, like all star, is a very dynamic star. It is always active and always changing. Actually, it is changing in different time scales, in time scales of seconds, minutes, hours, days, months, years, and could be millennia. So all the changes of different time scales have different origin and different explanations and different physics involved with that also. So the variability of the sun, which also allows us to understand the variability of any solar like stars or any astrophysical object for that matter. So the knowledge what you gain from this uh, stellar variability research, you can extend to other you know, astrophysical scenario as well. Here, this movie is actually taken from NASA's Solar Dynamic Observatory and is looking at uh, you know, the higher atmosphere of the sun, the low coronal heights. Here you see there are regions where emission is quite bright and there are emissions of the other part of the sun, uh, their emissions are comparatively darker. These regions where we see the emissions are high and a lot of these kind of structures in the form of a closed loop like they're called active regions and now we understand that all these active regions are actually because of the presence of strong magnetic field underneath in the form of sunspots so sunspots are magnetic flux tubes and they are always coming in pairs like the bar magnet experiment if you have done you have a north pole and a south pole here, the sunspots always come as a pair. And as you 
recall your bar magnet experiment, the magnetic planks of force start from the North Pole and it ends in the South Pole. Here also, there is always a connectivity of the two polarities and they are connected by these kind of loop structures and lots of very highly energetic uh, plasma is normally confined within this plasma tubes. But now, suppose, you know, because of certain disturbances or certain instabilities, these structures, if they are disturbed, like what is happening exactly right now here, you see this huge amount of material which was confined, it is expelled, it is uh, ejected, and amount of material is thrown into the planetary space, some material falls back. You see here the material is uh, some of them are falling back to the lower atmosphere, interacts with the lower atmosphere, you know, makes some brightenings and so on. Majority of the amount actually is thrown into the interplanetary space and they travel into the interplanetary space all the way to us. So if if these huge material interacts with us in the sense our neighborhood, you know, we are heavily populated with lots of satellites. Sometimes we are th th uh, talking about uh, taking a spacewalk, space tourism. This is going to be dangerous. This is going to be very, very harmful. In fact, these are called coronal mass ejections because of the eruptions. A huge amount of mass uh, from the corona is ejected and they travel as a, as a huge magnetic cloud through the interplanetary space and can reach us. So that's the <coughs> sort of study I will be talking about uh, you know, <coughs> a little later. Now, the other interesting aspect, particularly for physics student and uh, a student uh, of my background uh, is fascinating because here you see the sun provides as an ideal laboratory for plasma physics. Plasma is the state of uh, matter when it is a mixture of uh, uh, ions and charged particles and so on. Essentially, when you heat up uh, an, uh, a gaseous material, then beyond certain temperature, the, the constituents get uh, you know, uh, very much charged and you get a mixture of uh, neutrals and, and charged uh, uh, particles and so on. And that state of uh, matter, often it is also called the fourth state of matter, is called the plasma state. So majority of 99.9% .9 of universe is actually in the plasma state. And sun uh, being close to us, it provides us a unique opportunity to study this plasma state of matter through observations and our theoretical understanding and so on. You name any branch of physics, almost you know you can apply whether it is atomic physics, whether it is particle physics, nuclear physics, spectroscopy. So if you come from a uh, pure physics background, Sun actually provides you a unique uh, you know laboratory for verifying your understanding of uh, physical uh, laws and principles. The previous uh, slide I mentioned that these are called active regions, and the remaining region are called quiet region, but this is a complete misnomer. Nothing is quiet in, uh, in the sun, but these names have been given uh, several decades back when space observations were not available at all. We were not uh, gone to space and it appeared that, you know, the sun spots and the neighborhood regions are only active and the rest of the sun is uh, quiet. But uh, you will see, I will show other examples also that uh, nothing is actually quiet. I mean things do move and dynamically change everywhere almost on the sun. You just need to have such, uh, you know, you know, uh, higher capability uh, wise, you know, telescopes uh, and observing instruments to see these uh, dynamics. Now, again, uh, the point of uh, multi-wavelength, what I was talking about, that here I show three images. This is an image taken again on the photosphere. This is particularly taken to identify the locations where the magnetic field concentrations are, or so-called the sunspots are. These are called magnetogram images. And here you see very clearly that these are the locations where the, you know, uh, the sunspots are. And if I now go to the higher atmosphere, this is a, again, an extreme ultraviolet uh, image from the solar dynamic observatory in 
<coughs> in 171 angstrom, and this is 304 angstrom helium 2, representing uh, about, say, uh, 1600 kilometers, and this is about, say, 2000 kilometers. So, what you see clearly here is wherever there are sunspots, you have such kind of magnetic structures which extends all the way to the high in the atmosphere and they are having this kind of uh, confined loop like uh, connectivity which uh, which is also evolving and these loop structures they are also dynamic sometimes uh, they are steady over a few days but eventually beyond few days time they can uh, uh, they can erupt and can give rise to ejections and, and so on so very clearly wherever there are some spots in the in the lower atmospheric height at the surface of the sun, uh, there are connectivities which extends to all the way to the high corona, and you see these huge magnetic structures. So my point is that if you really want to study any dynamics in a global scale, it is important to have a multi-wavelength observational capabilities. Otherwise, you will not be able to study them in totality. So here, uh, these are images taken with different filters. Filters means it's like a, you know, you, you wear a, a red glass uh, and, a, and a, uh, uh, you know, goggles with a red or a, or a green or a blue, uh, you will see certain different things. And when you combine those three images, then uh, also it gives you a three-dimensional picture of the thing what you see. So that's what exactly what I'm talking about here, that take images from different you know, filters, which only allows you emission on certain wavelength uh, bands, and that will capture image of particular height in the atmosphere of the sun. And when you combine these images, then you get a three-dimensional picture of the atmosphere of the sun. And that is, is very much necessary. So that's on a, on a smaller time scales. Now I'm showing you a really, really very large time scales, sun all the way to earth. So as you can imagine, if you really want to capture the dynamics, what is happening in the sun and in the interplanetary space and its interaction with the, our nearest uh, you know, planets and including Earth, you need multiple telescopes. One telescope will not be able to cover. So here, several images are stitched. Here, uh, there is an image uh, which is uh, taken from, again, extreme ultraviolet image, uh, very close to the sun. This is the edge of the sun. You see something has uh, you know, ejected from here. This is called a, 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 a coronagraph. Hmm? Uh, this is a core one uh, coronagraph on the stereo spacecraft. Then this is the core two uh, coronagraph. This is called heliospheric imager one and heliospheric imager two. Uh, they're all in the stereo spacecraft. Combining all these uh, you know, images only, we are able to capture these ejecta and its propagation through the interplanetary space. So I'm just again going to highlight that how important it is to have uh, you know, space observations and space observations and ground observations combined with many different telescopes also, just not filters alone will do the job. If you are interested to look at very close to the sun and certain you know, small scale changes and all that, you have uh, certain observations. If you really want to study these huge dynamics and in this impact on Earth, because today's my lecture is the variability in the sun and its impact of Earth. So these are all short-term variability, right? I mean, happening in our, our uh, time scale. And these ejecta, they take sometimes a day or two to reach uh, Earth. So you have time to study their propagation and even tell if, I, if there is a satellite somewhere here, when these ejecta will come and hit this uh, satellite here so that we can uh, stop its operation and, and save some of its, uh, you know, here you see after almost a, a day or so, this, uh, you know, ejecta has uh, come here. So this is an area which is called also space weather. You know, today, um, uh, the weather in the space also need to be predicted. Uh, in our uh, younger days, if you recall, if a, bo a boatman uh, wants to go to the sea, he will uh, listen to the radio in the morning. Is it safe to go for fishing in the, in the sea? Uh, so uh, the forecast for them was uh, almost livelihood. Here also for the space technologies, uh, it is important for them to know that it's such a huge uh, solar uh, you know, blast is going to happen. These are called also solar storms. 
uh, and it is it safe to launch the satellite? Incidentally, just two weeks back, SpaceX, there were 40 satellites launched by a US uh, uh, commercial agency. They lost their satellites. Actually, they were destroyed. It's just not because of the directly the solar storm, but the solar storm, of course, carries these particles and so on. Uh, they are harmful, but they also disturb this environment. You see, Earth has its own magnetic field. So there is a magnetic uh, you know, shield outside the Earth. These are called magnetosphere. But when such a huge uh, you know, um, ejecta comes, it interacts with the magnetosphere and it can change the magnetosphere also. And when a satellite is launched, actually it goes through a particular trajectory in a particular time and so on. So somehow when these kind of disturbances are happening in the atmosphere, that uh, some of those calculations which they have done under certain other conditions do not satisfy. So the, the path of those uh, satellites were actually uh, already got disturbed and they had uh, interactions with each other and all that. So it was, it was the deviation of the uh, trajectory of the satellite path, which, which actually damaged the satellite rather than exactly the uh, ejecta itself. So there are many uh, you know, other uh, associated effects one needs to worry about when such a ejecta or solar storm happens in the sun. So this field is called uh, space weather now. It's a very, very exciting field. And uh, our other interesting aspect is in this particular field now, people from different branches uh, of uh, you know, uh, studies are getting involved. It's just not the solar physicists which are involved. Here, you, know, you can imagine there are people who work with Earth's uh, magnetosphere, Earth's stratosphere, and, and so on. They, uh, uh, they were earlier not so much uh, you know, acquainted with the changes in the sun because it always appears the sun is there. What is going to happen with the sun? Sun is going to be uh, you know, not going to change. That was the inherent assumption that sun doesn't vary for our, you know, our kind of purpose. But now it has been completely proven wrong. And the majority of the disturbances, what you see on the Earth's uh, you know, and, uh, you know, atmospheric uh, conditions, including the climate, has a very, very direct uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, influence from the sun's radiation, sun's uh, you know, emissions and the particles which are coming from the sun. So that's why it is a coupled uh, research field now and uh, the next generation need to really, really uh, worry about it this uh, much more. And as the technology evolves, as you can imagine that, you know, we are getting into more into the space, uh, you know, uh, domain, uh, we need to worry about more onto this. This is actually an example of a work again uh, by a group of people, including me and my student, uh, who is the first author here, of a quiet region in the sun. Uh, I was telling you that um, nothing is quiet in the sun. So this is a region in the sun where uh, you know we are using a very uh, you know. Today's uh, this is the biggest uh, solar telescope from the ground uh, at Big Bear Solar Observatory in the US, combined with uh, data from, from space uh, platforms like the NASA's uh, Solar Dynamic Observatory. We are using, again, multiple wavelength. We are mapping different layers of the atmosphere of the sun. What we are seeing is here in the photospheric level, as I was indicating or giving examples of the sunspots, which are much, much bigger, 5,000 kilometer. Here, these blue patches or the red dots, what you see are only size of 100 kilometers. So. so this 100 kilometer size magnetic field regions, you can only see if you have a very big solar telescope and very good seeing conditions and so on. So here, what we are observing is, when these blue guys are interacting with the red guys, they are actually canceling this magnetic field. And that is emitting this kind of jets. And these jets, when they propagate all the way up, they are responsible for the brightening of these higher layers in the corona. And uh, they are responsible for the heating of the corona. So far, I did not talk about one particular term or the temperature profile, I briefly mentioned that the different layers of the atmosphere of the sun having different temperatures. 
but this is this was actually not really well explained in the past that why it is that the corona is so hot because what you expect that uh, suppose you know you are at uh, bhopal and uh, you have come to dengital your temperature is much cooler right in dengital and you go to farther up in the himalayas the temperature will fall e uh, even lower so that is what is expected that if you do not have a energy source uh, then the temperature will be cooler and cooler when you go away from the uh, you know from the heating surface in the case of the sun all the energy source is right in the core of the sun right in the center of the this huge ball where thermonuclear reactions are taking place where temperature is tens of millions of kelvin but when we come to the surface the temperature is 6000 so it is expected that when you go up the temperature will fall but there are other non thermal processes which now explains the origin of this high temperature of the corona so these all these magnetic uh, you know uh, phenomena uh, conversion of the magnetic energy into heat and so on is responsible for this explanation so if i now again uh, can play this uh, movie and move it forward here what you see here there is magnetic cancellation between these opposite polarity fluxes and those are uh, you know emitting this kind of uh, jets very very tiny jets these were all of course not observable earlier and with the biggest telescope only you can see this and these jets are propagating to the upper corona and you see wherever there are jets you know uh, and if you just follow those jets you will see that they are responsible for this you know brightening in the higher up generating amount of uh, heat and so on so these kind of again multi wavelength Uh, you know study is allowing us to solve the mysteries of uh, you know uh, this coronal heating problem uh, able to identify these kind of small little flux uh, concentrations of 100 km size we were not aware of this you know 30 years back when i started my phd there were hardly any observations where there were indications theoretically that there should be such uh, you know small little flux concentrations available but uh, regular observations were not available so these are now been uh, you know very regular observations that are possible for such uh, dynamical studies so far i was talking about changes uh, of time variability of shorter time scale shorter means you no know, hours to days and so on now i am showing here solar eclipse images one taken at 2006 2008 2009 2010 this 2006 image is actually a, again a overlay of images taken in white light and iron 9 red filter and green filter what are advantages of these two different filters again these two different filters are actually representing different plasma structures in the corona and as you can see here that some often this red structure and the green structure is not perfectly overlapping with each other this again proves that coronal structures are multi thermal and these structures also change with time if i look at 2006 image incidentally now you see the coronavirus image right uh, coronavirus cartoon image when it was drawn first it also had this kind of helmet streamers and this kind of bubbles and so on and they think oh this looks like a solar corona image so the name coronavirus came actually from uh, this uh, background uh, image which i am showing here what i am highlighting here is that these coronal structures are actually changing over different long time scales number of years and all that now we know that these sunspots some days there are many sunspots some days there are no sunspots at all so this waxing and waning of the changing in the number of sunspots are responsible for the change in the magnetic global magnetic structure of the corona as well and here it clearly depicts this huge changes and why i'm actually showing this example also is that we are going to have our own space mission very soon aditya mission aditya mission will have a coronagraph instrument and that will have these two filter images as well actually it will have 
not only image, it will have a spectroscopic capabilities and spectroparameter capability. And we'll be able to do this kind of science in much, much greater detail and more regularly. We don't have to wait for a total solar eclipse for the sun, uh, for the moon to block the solar disk and see the corona. We'll be artificially blocking the solar disk by an instrument called Corona Graph, and we'll be taking such images as and when we want. So that's a real, real, uh, you know, uh, luxury. So very briefly, I also wanted to tell you that these global structure of the corona on large scale, how it is changing and how it evolves and all that. There are a lot of theoretical work also, which is happening within the country. I'm actually part of this um, uh, center in Kolkata as well. Professor Nandi and his students are primarily doing this work. Uh, they're doing also space weather predictions and they're studying the understand this you know uh, evolution of the magnetic field also in a larger scale they have already successfully you know predicted the solar eclipse images how it should look like you know a few days in in uh, advance of the solar eclipse and the verification and all that has given uh, a lot of uh, good confidence that their modeling efforts are also going into good direction. Very, very briefly, uh, Aditya L1, India's space mission to study the sun. It's a Make in India project. Indigenously, all the seven payloads, combination of optical, infrared, X-ray, uh, you know, uh, remote sensing payloads and the in-situ payloads, because we are going to a position called Lagrangian 1, are going to give us an enormous uh, amount of data and enormous possibilities of doing many, many different uh, scientific objectives, what we have been looking for uh, last uh, decades or so. Many institutions, as you see here, the logos are are involved in either the, in the hardware building or in the science uh, uh, operations and planning. Uh, so this is going to be really, really the next two decades, I would say, uh, you know, uh, main, uh, uh, main resource for solar research within the country. Now, very briefly again, how these sunspots are formed. The sunspots are magnetic structures that emerge beneath the surface. As you see from this animation, they are coming through these to uh, opposite polarity regions. And these white lines represent the magnetic field lines. But when these magnetic field lines are, you know, twisted or, you know, sheared, then beyond certain number of twists and all that, they can, uh, they can uh, explode. And that gives rise to the solar storms. So here again, I'm running the movie once more. These flux tubes, they come underneath the sun. And as they penetrate the surface of the sun, they create the sunspots. And the sunspots are connected by these magnetic loop structures, which you have seen from the UV images as well. And then after a certain time, when we have this kind of you know, twisting uh, magnetic reconnection, and you have this solar storms here. I indicated that these sunspots, sometimes there, there are many. There are sometimes there are no sunspots at all. Now, if I now plot this yearly sunspot number across last 400 years, what do you see here? That sometimes there are many sunspots. These are called solar maxima period. And there are period over which there are hardly few sunspots or sometimes no sunspots at all, depending on you know, a particular cycle. This is called the solar cycle. And the typical periodicity is about 11 years. It's not exactly 11 years because it's not a perfect sinusoidal. As you see it, there is a little variation plus minus one year of this 11 year. But what is to be noted here is there are periods where a certain cycle which has a larger amplitude and then the certain cycles which has so smaller amplitude. In fact, this last 100 years, we have very, very uh, aggressive data. And this is uh, a period, the maximum uh, solar cycle uh, in the last uh, century. There were also period over which almost 50 years, there were no sunspots recorded almost. And still we do not understand what went wrong with the production of the sunspot mechanism, which is now believed to be a, through a process called a dynamo process, which is happening inside the sun. 
went wrong or somebody switched off the dynamo. It's like, you know, you ride the bicycle and you get the light, suddenly you stop cycling, of course you don't get the light. So is it somebody, you know, uh, switched off this uh, dynamo uh, uh, operation? And then if somebody switched off, who then switched it on again? So this is a mystery still, we do not completely understand. There are certain uh, theories, but to understand all these, we need long-term data. And again, uh, being in India, this is a very, very huge uh, fortunate thing for us. Kodai Canal Solar Observatory has been one of the best observatories uh, in the globe for last more than 100 years. Of course, this was built by the Britishers and famous discoveries of uh, sunspot related phenomena were discovered in early 1905. We have digitized all these data, which has been collected through photographic plates and films. And as you see here again, if I just go back to the archive, 1st January 1958, I have an image in white light, I have an image in calcium K and H alpha. These are again two different, uh, you know, uh, chromospheric layers uh, of the atmosphere captured uh, through different uh, uh, spectroscopic uh, filters. And this is a, a fantastic data archive, probably one of the best of its kind in the globe. And uh, we have uh, digitized all of them. They're all available through this website. And the entire global community who works on the solar long-term variations are using this. I'm very proud of this uh, thing. And uh, even my uh, student who uh, passed from here, now he's in, in Germany. We have gone one more step. We have now collected data from 14 observatories across the globe and cross calibrated all those data. And we have created this uh, sunspot area time series. This is, uh, you know, for the last 140 years. And this is the best, uh, you know, current output of the sunspot area uh, based on daily cross calibrated area since 1874. And I'm proud that, you know, should be my former PhD student uh, with my colleagues from, uh, from Max Planck Institute have been able to produce this. There is another interesting aspect of the sunspot that the sunspot do not appear always in the same latitude. Uh, they, in the beginning of the cycle, they actually uh, appear in the higher latitude. This is the latitude which is plotting, this is equator and this is towards the pole. And with the progress of the solar cycle, they go to the equator. And actually the two uh, polarities are coming from the two equators, they cancel each other and then you get a sort of solar minima. And again, for the beginning of the solar cycle, you see in the ascending phases uh, here, the sunspot appear in the high latitude and the progression of the uh, solar cycle, this uh, guy moves to the equator. This particular pattern of sunspot uh, locations are called butterfly diagram. Very nicely, it looks like an individual butterfly for individual solar cycle. And there are lots of interesting properties here and all that I don't have time to explain, but this is the state of the art of the long-term data from the sun, which is available. And uh, we are uh, involved with this kind of research at the highest level as well. So my last slide that uh, for all these kind of variability of the, of the sun, whether it is short time scale, or long time scale demands a lot of uh, uh, data sources in multi wavelength and, of course, theoretical understanding. And that needs lots of band power, lots of uh, youngsters. Uh, and I think the future lies with these youngsters. We had a, a summer school a couple of years back, just before the pandemic year and lay. And I hope uh, we'll have more such uh, you know, workshops uh, in, uh, in this year onwards. And uh, this is uh, my uh, group or my PhD students at postdocs uh, who are engaged in, in this kind of different uh, research, uh, very, uh, very small way I have uh, highlighted today. And, and thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Benerzi. Uh, it was a great informative lecture. So now we'll open for the discussions. We got a few questions. Uh, so I'll just read out and then we'll open uh, uh, some audience. We'll give them opportunity to directly ask questions from you. Sure. So I'm asking this. The first question is uh, uh, asked by uh, Shamayela Fayaz. And he's the student of our uh, Chennai campus. And he's asking that what factors affect the variation of sunspots? 
Okay. It's a very good question. Uh, the complete answer we still do not have. <laughs> but uh, as I shown you, the sunspots are actually coming from underneath the sun. So theoretically, they are modeled as these kind of thick magnetic flux tubes, which comes from outside. Flux tubes are nothing but, you know, congregation of millions of magnetic field lines. Now the question is why, you know, there are, your question is why there are more uh, sort of uh, uh, bigger size sunspots and smaller size sunspots. Incidentally, what we find now is that actually there is not a continuous size distribution. There are sunspots which are of the size of few thousand kilometers. And then there could be smaller flux structures which are of 100 kilometer size. Intermediate sizes, all kind of magnetic flux concentration are not always uh, you know, seen. So this is a very interesting aspect why there is a preference about certain structures. This is again another field completely, uh, we call it you know, structure uh, uh, you know, preferences. Similarly, in the nature, we find you know, even in the solar surface, we have certain, uh, I did not talk about it, certain structures called granules. Then you have mesogranules and then supergranules. You don't see all possible structures, but you see some specific structures. So this is something to do, do with the magnetic convection in terms of the sunspot formation. So when, when the convection is along with the magnetic field, as time progresses, we see certain size structures are preferred and then they are formed. Now, I put his question slightly uh, extended. There are occasions where you see certain active regions, there are many sunspots. And those active regions are actually more dynamic and they give rise to huge flares and CMEs and so on. Simple sunspots, if they're isolated and all that, they will not be so much uh, you know, giving rise to solar storms and so on. So why there are certain places, there are many uh, you know, sunspot uh, voila, active regions and why they're simple, that we still do not understand uh, from a magnetic convection uh, completely. But observationally, it is seen that these are uh, you know, the reality, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, there is one more question uh, from Sarvan, and he is asking: Is there a certain cycle through which the sun goes through that varies the behavior of the sun? Yes. So basically, every solar cycle uh, is characterizing the magnetic uh, nature of that particular period, and so I I don't see the question actually structured very well, but I think what uh, the, uh, the person is trying to uh, ask the question is whether one cycle has any uh, sort of similarity with the other cycle or whether there is a relation of the next cycle and so on. I can put it probably in that, uh, that context. So the no two cycles are same and we normally do not have a very clear understanding why certain cycles are very big and why certain cycles are uh, completely smaller. I will only point out that these processes are not very linear processes. These are non-linear processes and non-linear processes, you know, is not very easy to predict. So uh, there are statistical, they are called stochastic variations in these, you know, different parameters, which is responsible for a solar cycle. Because of that variation, uh, how they will evolve at certain period of time, it is not predictable. That's the beauty of a nonlinear system. Uh, thank you, Dr. Banerjee. I hope uh, uh, the person got his answer. So uh, <laughs> this is a, a more general question uh, from uh, Ayush Vasalwar, and he's our VIT Bhopal uh, student. And he's asking that, what uh, is there any uh, problem statement on which ARIES as an institution is working on? Uh, because uh, uh, all around the globe, a uh, lot of inst institutions are there and they are working on the uh, common problems of science. And then they are reaching towards the conclusion individually. So what uh, probably what I have understood from his question uh, is he wants to ask that, uh, is it possible that everyone can start working on a different, different problems to save some time? So how do you take this question uh, to answer his query? So probably I will, uh, yeah, it's a philosophical point of view, but I, I would say that in being a, a premier research institute, that's a liberty the scientists have here. 
every individual scientist have his or her own research uh, problems or own research areas. And that's the difference between an industry or, or, or a academia. Academia also evolves with time. Today, what is important may not be important tomorrow because uh, once a research problem you are dealing with, if it is answered tomorrow, you have to start thinking completely afresh a new research area uh, you know, down the line. So um, again, coming back to your first question, areas do not work in the such fashion that institute will have you know, as a research area um, you know, predefined. So in scientists have freedom to identify research uh, areas and work. Having said that, ARIS has a responsibility to provide these national facilities to the community. We maintain the biggest telescope in the country. So that mandate is very clear that we have to keep the telescope ready and the backend instruments uh, you know, as a fully functional, which the scientists from all over the world is going to use. So that's one big mandate and a very focused mandate that uh, this is your primary responsibility to make this telescope uh, you know, fully functional uh, with, along with the backend instruments and so on. But as far as research is concerned, a scientist, uh, we, uh, the director will not tell you that you point this telescope to this particular galaxy and do this particular work. No, the scientist has complete freedom to use this telescope for any scientific purpose he or she may wish to do. Uh, thank you, Dr. Banerjee. You have taken very well this particular question because we, uh, being working in the science field, have been asked this question from the general audience that what is the rationale behind uh, you know, investing this much huge amount and uh, uh, working together in the worldwide. So there is another question, uh, Dr. Pradeep, uh, you may discuss it. Um, the question is, uh, how long does it take to form the sunspot? Okay. So basically been, he's curious about uh, the formation of the sunspot. That is correct, that is correct. I understand. Again, uh, since we can't see inside the sun, right? So all the things which is happening inside the sun are based on theoretical models and their, uh, you know, their parametric uh, numbers and so on. What we see on the surface from observational point of view, it takes sometimes few hours to days to form the sunspot on the surface. But since the sunspot comes from the base of the convection zone, I did not talk about it inside the sun, now it is believed that about 30% is convective. And the convection, this is called the base of the convection layer or a layer which is called also tachocline is about say 30% depth in the sun. And it is now believed that the flux tubes, they get generated or flux concentrations in the form of uh, you know, flux tubes get uh, prepared in this tachocline layer or the base of the convection zone. And because these flux tubes are lighter than the surrounding, as uh, you saw from the animation, they float. And so the floating time scales still again will depend on a lot of other parameters and so on. So we still do not have a very clear picture, uh, you know, how fast it can be uh, to rise up to the surface. But if we restrict to our observational domain, whatever evidences we have, it takes a few days uh, to form a sunspot. But again, that will vary a lot uh, from the sizes of the sunspots and the you know, active region uh, and, and so on. And the other question can be actually extended, how long the sunspots actually leave? Because again, it will depend on the complexity of the active region, how much interactions it has with the other polarities and neighborhoods and so on. Uh, sometimes it, the sunspots can leave for a few days to a few weeks. So there are active regions which can be uh, you know, alive for a full one rotation of the sun, which is about 27 days. So there are a lot of you know, variations in this. That's why the, uh, the subject is also very interesting and uh, more challenging. It's uh, no, no single number can be assigned to these things. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Um, one more question from this friend, and uh, he's asking why should we study CMEs? Okay. So there are many aspects of uh, why do we study CMEs. One is, of course, uh, just academic interest that we need to know that, you know, 
I mean, this is something that the youngsters have to understand that we are little mad guys, you know, uh, we are not normal uh, guys. So we find uh, always uh, uh, try to understand something which is not easy to explain. That's how uh, discoveries are done. You see, there is a difference between a discovery and uh, just doing routine, uh, you know, uh, research work, so to say. So if you want to really go into an area of unknowns, uh, you have to look for something which is not explainable so easily. And our people have not explained in the form of research publications and all that. So that's our, uh, you know, sort of approach towards uh, towards science or innovation. So you have to be innovative to explain something which has not been explained before. If it is already explained, it doesn't excite some of us. There are people who uh, will be enjoying to do uh, similar things a number of times, that's, then that's absolutely no problem. But somehow we look for such, such opportunities. Now, that's why you have asked, why do we study the CMEs? The CMEs are these magnetic structures. We do not still understand why these CMEs are formed completely. Of course, there are certain, uh, you know, very sort of uh, phenomenological explanations that, you know, these kind of active regions are there, and then they uh, will, uh, you, know, uh, each, uh, you know, because of instabilities, uh, they will throw away the mass and coronal mass ejections are formed. But we still do not understand completely because no true CMEs are same. No true CMEs are same. I mean, we have observed some 50, 60,000 uh, CMEs, uh, you know, in our group itself, but we don't see actually no uh, two CMEs are uh, having similar, exactly similar properties. So all CMEs are having different properties. So now to understand why CMEs are rejected, why they're accelerated and why they're, you know, propagating at different speeds in the interplanetary space, uh, space and all that, we need to understand all these processes. That's again, more of an academic interest. But the major other uh, application, as I said, are these CMEs are very harmful for our space assets. They are uh, actually, uh, uh, you know, directly impacting with our satellites. They're impacting uh, with, um, with our magnetosphere. It is changing our magnetosphere. Sometimes when the CMEs are very strong, they will actually penetrate our magnetosphere and then it will actually interact with our power system. There have been several incidences where there have been complete power outages in, uh, you know, in the particularly in the Western world, and that is not affordable. We are more familiar with the load shedding and all that, but not in the Western world. And it has happened in the severe winter in Canada uh, during such a CME interaction with the thermal power stations and so on, and uh, electrical, uh, you know, transformers and so on. So, uh, those kind of incidences are not uh, possible to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, not affordable. There are other effects also. People are taking the um, polar flights. Like, you know, you take a flight from India to all the way to US. You don't go via Europe, but to shorten the distance, you can take a full polar flights. But when you take a polar flights, actually you expose yourself to these energetic particles, which are associated with the CMEs. And uh, they will uh, be, pretty harmful for, for the passengers who are there in the flight because these CMEs, they cannot penetrate the magnetic field lines, but they guide it. I've not talked about it much, but they will actually try to move or enter to the Earth's atmosphere to the pole because in the polar regions, we have uh, you know magnetic field lines where there is a little gap there. Hmm? So that's again, another effect. So CMEs do have a lot of harmful effects so we need to really predict the CME arrival and which CMEs are strong and, and, and so on, yeah. Uh, so uh, the Venkat is our VIT Bhopal student and he is asking that whatever facts you have discussed about the sun, uh, all uh, whether they are same for all the stars or uh, it is there is some dissimilarity? Yeah, it's again a very good question. They're not same for all the stars. Of course, there are solar-like stars and unfortunately, we do not have such great observations available for other uh, stars. As you know, majority of the stars are um, only studied as a point object. This is the advantage of sun being close to us. We are having so much of knowledge about the sun, uh, about its magnetic field, about its magnetic field structure, uh, the, the periodicities of different variabilities. We don't have that information for other stars, unfortunately. So there are studied more statistically, 
Uh, of course, other magnetic stars do have stellar cycles as well. Uh, magnetic fields are also there for many stars, but such observations with such details are not available for other stars. It's very hard to even detect a magnetic field in other stars. So um, we do understand why there are certain differences also because these magnetic field is because of the rotation of the sun. And I did not talk about it in, in great detail. And sun doesn't rotate uniformly, it rotates differentially. So how uh, you know, differentially it rotates, what is the mass of the uh, sun? How old is the sun? You know, all these things matter for the strength of the magnetic field. And uh, different stars uh, have different ages and different rotations will have certain differences in their magnetic field properties. So these things are studied also uh, uh, in general. Uh, thank you, Dr. Banerjee. There is another question from the VIT Bhopal student, Anandita Datta. And she is asking, uh, what is the role of computer science in aerospace or more specifically in the study of sun? What else we can achieve by uh, utilizing the today's power of computations? That is absolutely essential. Most of my students are, uh, can get a job in anywhere in the world, in any computer <laughs> center. Uh, because we do uh, more sophisticated uh, computer algorithms. They, they do, do, do develop their programs to do the data analysis. Yet also uh, no one big thing is today, uh, the amount of data what we collect from, uh, if I just take solar observations, you know, we take images every 18 seconds, uh, a solar image. And when I'm talking about say seven filter, such images every 18 seconds. Suppose I have to observe just one, uh, you know, one hour observations, how many images you are taking. Hmm? We are handling actually terabytes of data in our servers. So we all use, uh, you know, clusters. We use uh, high performance uh, computers. And uh, my particularly students are getting uh, more involved into, into uh, you know, AI ML applications. Uh, they are having all kinds of statistical uh, analysis uh, knowledges, uh, you name it, uh, you know. So this is uh, very, very important. And in fact, since you asked the question, um, I will just make it a, uh, another announcement. We have Astronomical Society of India meeting in, uh, in March at the end of this year. The, we have a session now, uh, academia and industry. We want to actually let industry know that the kind of skill set the astrophysics students are having because of the highly sophisticated utilization of the computers, programming languages, you know, Python, you know, I mean, whatever is now modern day, uh, you know, uh, the databases, you know, we are, you know, the Kodaikinal database is sitting in a server with the 30 terabyte of this space. We have developed our own, uh, you know, uh, search engines and so on. So, you know, of course, computer, uh, uh, you know, uh, advancement in terms of programming and uh, hardware is crucially dependent on astronomy. I mean, this is, uh, and solar physics is a prime example because of the large data what we are dealing with here. Uh, okay, so there is another question from one of our student, uh, Urvika, and she is asking that, uh, uh, there are different theories uh, they are telling about that increment of temperature from the photosphere to transition region. So uh, what are that, uh, I mean, uh, is there any uh, established theory behind it? Or if we know it, so can we use these things for any practical application, the increment of the temperature? Okay. Yeah, it's a good question. I did not talk about in detail about the several uh, different um, you know, uh, theories of coronal heating, what she's referring to is why, again, the atmosphere of the sun is uh, much hotter than the, uh, the surface, mainly the photosphere. I talked, uh, I briefly talked about the reconnection, which is the conversion of the magnetic energy into the heat and, uh, and kinetic energy. There is also a very popular and uh, very well established and accepted the theory now is called the wave heating that we do generate these uh, waves in the surface of the sun or in the lower atmosphere. These are magnetic waves. They carry a lot of energy to the upper atmosphere. And if you can dissipate those waves, they will uh, provide you that amount of uh, heating energy. So, you know, what happens, 
you know, all these theoretical models or the numerical simulations, what you do in some way or other, you know, that, that intellectual exercise allows you to think about applications otherwise. Now, energy generation through MHD is still a laboratory, uh, you know, in environment to do that is still far from technological, uh, you know, uh, development. But we don't know, maybe 50 years down the line, energy generation by MHD processes will be a, a, a simple thing. What happens, I would also like to tell this to this audience, is that some of us do basic sciences and some do applied sciences. Both are important for advancement of science. Often for smaller countries or new countries, this is a, a luxury. Can you afford to do basic sciences? Because you don't get immediate result uh, tomorrow. But unless you make that development of basic sciences, you will not know what uh, technology you want to develop. You have to always borrow the technology from elsewhere. So this understanding has been there with the developed world and they balance their uh, funding to the basic science research and the, and the applied science research uh, you know, in a great way. So this question actually allows me to say this, this uh, energy generation by MHD processes is an alternative energy source, but we still do not have the technology to develop that in the lab. But who knows, 50 years down the line, 100 years down the line, we will have MHD generation, you know? So, uh, but you need to understand the process of MHD. So these are all MHD processes, MHD wave phenomena, MHD, you know, uh, magnetic reconnection. This is happening anywhere in the universe, you know, in the interplanetary space. So we have to get that, that process inbuilt into our laboratory or our energy generation, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, reservoir. We are still not there, but who knows? <laughs> We may be uh, able to do that 50 years down the line. Uh, thank you, Dr. Banerjee. Uh, there is uh, another question from our VIT Bhopal student, uh, Mr. Parth Patil. And he's asking that how uh, the BTEC students can join such research projects. Okay. So it's, uh, thank you for asking this question. I did not talk about the career opportunities much. We have started a program called MTEC PhD program at ADS also. This has been there in uh, in uh, in Institute of Astrophysics uh, for the last ten years, and we have more or less, uh, you know, um, taken the same idea, and we have a collaborations with Calcutta University, and this is called the MTech PhD program. So the BTech students can apply into this uh, MTech PhD program through the great scores and interview and all that, and they can uh, join the PhD. That's a state entry for this, uh, and uh, we do understand the really importance of. Uh, you know, technological uh, expertise, particularly on, in our instrument development as well. At ADES, as I said, we have two roles to play. One is to do fundamental basic research, applied research, but we also maintain facilities. We build instruments. We are now thinking of building instruments for space programs. So those instrumentation cannot be done without the help of engineers. So we do have in our faculty, we have engineering faculty and science uh, research faculty as well. But in future, we are actually planning to have, uh, you know, more academic minded, uh, you know, engineering faculties. And that is possible if you start with a PhD program. And that is something which we have initiated as well. Uh, okay, so we have with uh, one student, uh, Mr. Suresh Babu, and he has posted a few of the questions. So I just tell him to unmute himself and uh, uh, ask the question directly from our speaker. Suresh, you can unmute yourself. Suresh, are you there? Yes, sir. Uh, good morning, sir. So, uh, is it possible uh, to observe the solar interior so we can able to understand the, the solar activities better? Hmm. Okay, very good question. Yeah, so we do have a technique now uh, to indirectly observe the interior of the sun through a, a, a system called helioseismology. Sun also, you know, vibrates in all possible different modes. And there are sound waves which are 
generated inside the sun and they all these sound waves when they overlap each, each other you get a combination of their vibrations on the surface of the sun so if you can make a very precise measurement about the oscillations on the surface of the sun you can infer what are the root cause of these vibrations inside the sun it's like seismology you know earthquake we do uh, observe the earthquakes and by observing the earthquake we talk about the properties of the earth inside right so same techniques are now being used and hydrosismology is a pretty well developed uh, field now for last two and a half decades uh, almost and through that we have now good amount of knowledge about the interior of the sun but these are of course model dependent and all that how the density changes inside how it's possible uh, you know uh, temperature can change inside and so on. So this is a field called helioseismology. Thank you very much for your explanation, sir. And I have uh, one more question. Uh, we were speaking about uh, ultraviolet telescope, X-ray telescopes. Uh, how radio telescopes are used for the observation and what is the best ever findings from radio telescopes? Okay, good question. I did not cover that part at all. So uh, most of the radio telescope so far is uh, from the ground. And uh, as I indicated in my that electromagnetic spectrum thing, that of course radio wavelengths also do penetrate our atmosphere and there is no problem in, uh, in uh, observing them. Only issue with the radio telescope as far as observation of the sun is, you know, the, uh, the sun is too bright for, <laughs> for uh, the radio telescopes. So they have to do a lot of other processes to, you know, integrate uh, uh, the, uh, the signal which is coming from the sun. So they do a technique called interferometry. You can have multiple, you know, uh, detectors either in the form of a, of a uh, you know, uh, T junction arrays and, and so on, or you can have uh, small dishes or you can have a big single dish as well, but which is there in the GMRT and for very, very specific, uh, you know, more GMRT does look at the sun. But the spatial resolution, what they get from radio observations are not very good. Uh, because with the shorter wavelength, we are able to achieve much, much better spatial resolution. And when we have much better spatial resolution, then you could see much greater details of the final fine structures and all that. So having said that, since the radio sun, again, represents a different uh, kind of you know, uh, coronal heights and so on, and it can be used also to look at the extended corona. Uh, it is used, it is used, I did not cover it. There are uh, also groups in India, uh, at, 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 uh, in Institute of Astrophysics also. We have a, a radio heliograph at Gauri Bidhanur. Uh, there also they use this uh, you know, series of antennas and uh, by uh, you know, interferometry, they look, create this you know, uh, radio image of the sun. And they observe the CMEs also from those uh, radio images. So they are used. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, sir. So now uh, I think we are uh, ahead of our the scheduled time. And uh, uh, on behalf of VIT Bhopal establishment, so administration and management, I'd like to thank our today's speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Deepankar Banerjee. And he has spared some time from his busy schedule and join us today in this interactive session. I'll thank the audience also to making, uh, for making uh, this uh, uh, session very much interactive and live. And uh, uh, VIT Bhopal is celebrating a National Science Week from 25th of February to 3rd March 2022 to commemorate the discovery of Raman effect by Sir C.V. Raman and India, and it is celebrating, uh, the country is celebrating the 75th year of uh, independence, Ajadi Ka Amrit Mahotsa, and we are organizing this lecture series where um, uh, speakers from national and international repute, they will be joining us and then be speaking. This is information for the audience that tomorrow uh, we will be having two sessions, one from Dr. Vilas Shailke, he will be speaking on, uh, he's basically the CEO of Recharge and Energy Private Limited, he will be speaking on energy for mobility and stationary storage, especially with lithium ion batteries we have been seeing. And then he has uh, proposed some solutions and he's working on the sodium ion batteries. And then we'll be having another talk by Mr. Dhananjay Rawal. He is a science enthusiast and communicator uh, from Ahmedabad. And he will be speaking on science and technology. 
in ancient Indian temples, and then by using those theories, he will be demonstrating some experiments. So I once again thank our today's speaker and all that uh, participants for uh, joining us. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much for your time as well, yeah. Good.